Oh, now we are. Okay, so folks, again, this is just a real quick overview of some of the demo scopes that are out. Um, and hopefully I'll make the introduction really short so you can have the rest of the period just as an open lab to review for our lab exam. Um, so the lab exam, folks, is next Tuesday. Um, so this, this coming week on Thursday, I'll tell you a little bit of the setup of the lab exam. Um, those of you that have had a and you're already familiar with how we give most of our lab exams, lab practicals. One difference will be that each of your benches will be a self-contained lab exam. So we'll have eight to nine stations um, at each bench. So you'll just, be, you'll just be rotating through your bench. We give you five minutes per station. There's usually four to five questions per station. So it should take us about 45 minutes to do a full rotation. And then unlike a &P folks, we don't let you go back to stations, right? So you only have your five minutes. And then once we've completed a full rotation, there's a part two of the lab exam, which are some multiple choice type questions. Um, I'll have the multiple choice questions attached to your short answer sheet. Um, usually the um, station questions are really short answers. And I'll have the multiple choice questions attached to the short answer sheet so that if you finish at a station early, you can start working on the multiple choice type questions. Once we finish the rotation, I'll pass out the data link sheets and you'll have an additional 20 minutes to finish up the multiple choice type questions. Make sure you transfer your answers to the data link sheet. So the whole, the whole exam folks should take a little over an hour. And what we usually do is start later than normal. Um, so for example, we might be starting at 8.45, um, maybe as late as 9 a.m., but I'll make sure Thursday to let you know the start time. And I'll also post it on Canvas, right? Um, I would suggest folks just still try to come early. You know, it's better to be early rather than late. If you're late um, to the lab exam, we don't give you extra time. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, again, folks, Dr. Holland this weekend set up a number of demo scopes around the classroom. Um, so, I just wanted to briefly go over those and ask you a few questions. Before I forget, I also had two bonus um, protozoa for you. And the um, description folks are up on the microscope cabinet there. The first one is called Trichonympha, and this is a really cool protozoan. It's a symbiont of termites. It lives in the intestinal tracts of termites, and it's a flagellate, so it has flagella. And in addition, it's a very cool organism, it has bacterial spirochetes that are attached to its surface. And so not only do the flagella help the trichonympha with motility, but the spirochetes on the surface also help with motility. So it's a fascinating organism. The trichonympha produces cellulase. What do you think cellulase does? Hydrolyzes cellulose, right? And where would we find cellulose? In plant cell walls, yeah? And what do termites like to eat? Wood, yeah? So termites, remember, they belong to kingdom animalia. No animals can make cellulase. So we might ask, how do the termites digest the cellulose and the wood they eat? Well, it's with the help of their intestinal protozoa. Isn't that cool? OK, so it's win-win. What do we call win-win symbiosis? Mutualism, awesome, awesome. Great, you guys. And then the next um, protozoal pathogen we have is called um, trichomonas. And trichomonas is a sexually transmitted infection. Um, the, the awesome thing is, folks, that if you had at least a female patient and you suspected that she might be suffering with a trichomonas infection, you can do a vaginal swab and a smear. And if you had, if you had a microscope, access to a microscope, you'd probably diagnose the trichomonas in like five minutes. So we do have stain, um, some stain um, smears for you. These great big cells that have an oval nucleus, these would be the epithelial cells from the patient. And then um, the, it's a, they're rather faintly staining, but these larger blue organisms, those are the trichomonas. And you can see how big they are, right? And then yesterday in the lab, I had mislabeled some of these dark staining nuclei are either cystocytes or the uh, nuclei of uh, neutrophils, right? So on the lab exam, folks, again, the specimen is going to give you a lot of information. The only specimen I would give you where it's a vaginal swab from a, a, a female human, right, is going to be trichomonas. 
right? Um, if it's a urethral exudate from a man complaining of burning up on urination, who do you think that's going to be? I see you're going to read it. So folks, read the questions carefully. Often the description of the sample gives you so much information. And, and I think you remember that I said, pr your previous colleague said often they knew the identity of the microbe before they even looked through the microscope or before they looked at the photomicrograph because they just knew from the description from the source, right? So again, carefully read the questions because there'll be hints in the, uh, the description, okay? So folks, with regard to either trichonymph or trichomonas, are they eukaryotes or prokaryotes? They're eukaryotes, which domain? You carry it good. Um, they're protists. Are they animal-like protists, plant-like protists, or fungal-like protists? Animal-like, and what do we call animal-like protists? Protozoa. Protozoa, good, okay. Um, with regard to symbiosis, folks, what kind of symbiosis is trichonympha involved in? Mutualism, good. And what kind of symbiosis is trichomonas involved in? Parasitism, right? They benefit, but they cause harm to their host. Good, excellent, folks, okay. And then um, just a reminder that last time we had passed out this partial concept map, it's not complete, but we had brainstormed this last spring semester getting ready for the first lab exam. And the, the, um, we were, again, you know, I love concept maps. So I, I put together this partial concept map and some of the students last semester thought it was helpful, so I wanted to make sure you had a copy. It's not complete, folks. I hope by Thursday, I'll have a completed concept map. I'm using a big piece of, of um, white paper, so we'll have that posted um, hopefully by next Thursday. So again, folks, I thought what I would do is um, just walk through the stations, and then it, my thought was for the movie, I could write up the samples that are at the benches, and then I could just quiz you a little bit. And again, this isn't exhaustive. This isn't necessarily the questions on the lab exam, but they're the questions that are coming to my mind. Um, and very often, that's how I'm writing the lab exam. It's like, oh, you know, we studied this. What should I ask? All right, so on bench one, folks, we have um, um, legume root nodules on the scope. And we probably also have a, uh, a photograph of the um, root nodules of the legumes. So who do you know lives in the root nodules? Rhizobium, good. And let's see here, our rhizobium, which domain do rhizobium belong to? Which domain do rhizobium belong to? Bacteria. Good, excellent. Domain bacteria, awesome, you guys. Which really cool enzyme do rhizobium make when they're inside the root nodule? Nitrogenase. And what's the function of nitrogenase? Nitrogen fixation. Good. Can you just tell me, like, quickly, um, what do we mean by nitrogen fixation? What do we start with? What do we end up with? We start with molecular nitrogen, right? Two nitrogen atoms with a triple covalent bond, right? And what does nitrogenase do to molecular nitrogen? Converts it to ammonia, yeah. Can organisms use molecular nitrogen as a source of nitrogen to make proteins and nucleic acids? No. Nope, right? Can organisms use the ammonia to make nitrogen-containing organic molecules? Right, yeah, so we're converting the um, inusable molecular nitrogen to a usable form of nitrogen, the ammonia. Awesome. Why can't the rhizobium just carry out nitrogen fixation free living in the soil? Yeah, good. The nitrogenase is inactivated by molecular oxygen, so it requires an anaerobic environment, and that's what the root nodules provide. Good. Awesome. Um, what kind of symbiosis is the rhizobium legume? Mutualism, win-win, right? Good. Excellent, folks. All right, and then the next one is a slide of no stock. And we know that um, no stock can form two different types of cells. One, um, one cell has chlorophyll A. What's the function? Oxygenic, Oxygenic photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Good. The second cell is called a heterocyte, and it doesn't carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. What's the function of the heterocyte? Say again, sorry. 
It's not reproduction, but that's a, you're on a good track. Heterocytes, folks, with cyanobacteria. Nitrogen fixation, right? So which cool enzyme is in the heterocyte? Nitrogenase. Why, why do the cyanobacteria, like Nostock, have to create a different cell for nitrogenase? It's an anaerobic environment, right? In the other cells performing oxygenic photosynthesis, what are they making? Oxygen, right? So the nitrogenase couldn't function in those cells. So the cyanobacteria evolved the heterocyte. Great, you guys. Um, no stock, which domain do no stock belong to? Good, domain bacteria, excellent. And then, folks, the next station are biofilms. Could you hold up that big old biofilm? Oh, yeah, yeah, that one, right? Okay, so, folks, if we put a biofilm, maybe from kombucha, right? Thank you. On the lab exam, we said to name, I know, right? Name, name the structure. What are you going to tell us? Biofilm. That's all. You don't, yeah, just biofilm, right? Um, what's living in the biofilm? Bacteria, yeast possibly, right? Um, which biofilm did you sample from your bodies? The tooth, the tooth biofilm, right? So if we had a gram stain of a, um, a tooth scrape, could you identify your cells? What color would they be in a gram stain? Pink, good, right? And um, if there were little, little tiny purple cells, what do you think those are? Yeah, gram-positive bacteria, and they're little tiny, tiny um, red cells. Who do you think those are? Is it gram-negative bacteria? Good, good job, folks. And then um, on um, seat four, where Destiny is, there's an Ascomycetes poster. So let me see here. Um, so folks, remember, thank you, thank you. So remember, folks, that there's three classes or divisions of um, fungi, the ascomycetes, the zygomycetes, and the basidiomycetes. So folks, help me out here. Um, which class does penicillium belong to? Ascomycetes, yeah. Which class does saccharomyces belong to? Ascomycetes, what about candida albicans? Ascomycetes, right, what about claviceps? Thanks. Cla uh, Ascomycetes. So, folks, one one strategy is, um, how should I say this? If if you remember the exceptions to the rule, right, that makes your life easier. So, most of the fungi we've studied are belong to which class? Ascomycetes, right? So, remember, if you're in doubt, just say ascomycetes, and nine times out of ten, you'll be right. Can you name um, one of the fungi that we studied that is a zygomycete? Rhizopus, good, the bread mold. And can you name a fungus we studied that's a basidiomycete? Mushrooms, right? Good. Good job, folks. And what kind, if, if your ascomycete makes sexual spores, what kind of sexual spores do they make? Ascospores, good, excellent. And then the um, going along with the ascomycetes, the next slide, and um, auger plate there is a penicillium. Which cool substance does the fungus penicillium make? Penicillin, good. And folks, if we gave you a plate of penicillium, what are the filamentous white structures on the top of the auger? What are they called? Aerial hyphae, good. What is the powdery blue? Powdery blue on top. Those are the canidia spores. Yeah, the canidia. Are they sexual or asexual spores? Asexual, good. Folks, if we flip the plate over and we ask you what are the thin white filaments penetrating the auger, what would you tell me? Vegetative hyphae. Vegetative hyphae, what's their job? Secrete hydrolytic enzymes, start digesting food, and then what do they do? Nutrients. Good. Absorb the smaller nutrients, right? And that's why fungi are said to have an absorptive type of nutrition. Awesome, folks. And and just so I won't forget, um, we say most fungi are called saprobes. What are saprobes? Say, I'm sorry. Dead organisms. They they live off of dead organisms, right? So remember, folks. Fungi are, are fungi photoautotrophs or chemoheterotrophs? 
They're chemoheterotrophs, right? And most of them in nature live off dead plants, dead animals, so they're really important recyclers. Only occasionally do they get impatient and invade living organisms, right? Usually they're really good recyclers in nature. The last station, folks, at Bench 1 is Claviceps purpurea. So Claviceps can cause infections of... What's their host when they cause infections? Is it plants? Yeah, can you give a specific plant that claviceps will infect? Like, like grains, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, and for some reason they really like to, to um, infect rye, yeah? Okay, so when they're growing, say, in the rye, what are they making that can cause harm if ingested? Ergotamine, good, folks. So is ergotamine heat stable? Yeah, right? So if we grind up the grain to make flour and then use the flour to, say, bake bread, is ergotamine still active? Yes. Yeah. So, folks, if you ingested flour that had ergotamine in it, what are some of the clinical signs and symptoms? Okay, vasoconstriction, and what does that cause? Yeah, it caused death, right? Cell death, necrosis, right? Um, what else? What's another clinical sign or symptom? Hallucinations, LSD-like hallucinations, because the, the chemical structure of ergotamine is really similar to LSD, right? What's another um, clinical sign? Miscarriage, right? Because it causes smooth muscle contraction of the uterus. Good, folks. So in humans or other animals, is um, clavisex, does it, does it cause an infection? Is it a mycosis or... It's an intoxication, right? You're ingesting preformed toxin. What do we call fungal toxins? Mycotoxins. Mycotoxins. Excellent. Good. All right. So that's bench one, folks. And then um, bench two starts out with candida. So, folks, um, is candida, which, which um, domain do candida belong to? You carry good. Which kingdom? Which kingdom? And, and that is important, you guys, on the, um, on the exam. Make sure that you're giving the right answer. So if I ask for, it's candida. If I ask for domain, what domain is it? You carry good. If I ask for kingdom, what is it? Eight. Um, candida, albicans. Yeah. Good. Fungi. And since um, candida is normally unicellular, what do we call unicellular yeasts? Oh. <laughs> well, there you go. What do we call unicellular fungi? Yeast. Good. How does candida reproduce asexually? Budding. Excellent. What's another yeast we study? Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, what's practical application for Saccharomyces cerevisiae? How do humans use it? For it to make leavened bread, to make, to make beer, to make wine, right? And which metabolic pathway does Saccharomyces perform that, that make them useful in preserving um, the nutrients, say, from fruit juices or grains? Um, what metabolic pathway permits our bread dough to rise? What's it called? Alcoholic fermentation, right? So sugars are converted to which end products? Ethanol. Ethanol, good. A two-carbon alcohol and? Why does our bread dough rise? Carbon dioxide, good. All right, good job, folks. Um, can, we'll go back to candida. So folks, um, can, can candida be a commensal? And remember, commensals are, um, they're in a symbiotic relationship where they're benefiting, but they neither harm no benef nor benefit their host. Can candida act as commensals? Yeah, we probably all have some candida colonizing us, right? But may, given the opportunity, may they become parasites? Yes, right? They're opportunistic pathogens. Can you name some situations in which, in your patient, candida was could switch from being a commensal to becoming a parasite. 
good broad spectrum antibiotics, you kill all the good protective lactic acid bacteria, the candida don't die because they're fungi, and now they can reproduce to really high levels. What other situations? So think of any situation, folks, where your patients would be immunocompromised. Can you name a viral pathogen that causes a collapse of the immune system? Yeah, HIV AIDS, right? So. Um, what about transplant recipients? Are they often on immunosuppressive therapy, right? Um, what about cancer patients? Are, is the therapy they go through immunosuppressive? Yeah. What about your patients who have diabetes? Yeah, right? So again, folks, if you have a patient that's presenting with recurrent candida infections or has a really severe candida infection, what do you want to ask? What's going on, right? Is there something happening with my patient, right, that would explain why maybe um, their defenses are lowered? Good. Okay. What kind of infections can candida cause? Where might you see it presenting in your patient? In the mouth? Yeah. How would you, just looking in your patient's mouth, how would it appear? White. Yeah, white creamy, thick blanket. If you took a swab and made a smear, folks, could you verify it's candida? Mm-hmm. What are you looking for? Big budding yeasts. Good. Can it cause really painful sore throats? Yeah. Can it cause really painful anal rectal infections? Yeah. In women, can it cause um, vaginal infections? Yes. Good. Okay. And then, folks, on bench two, the next specimen are our mushrooms. So to which class of fungi do mushrooms belong? Basidiomycetes. And you guys, a lot of times you're, you're saying the right answer. I just don't hear well. So not, not to make you think like you, you aren't saying the right answer. So what kind of sexual spores do mushrooms make? Basidiospores. What's the function of the cap? cap that are yummy to eat as long as they're not poisonous? What's the function of the cap of the mushroom? What's the function of the cap? Remember, the cap has those beautiful um, gills, those paper-thin gills. And what are on the gills? The basidia. And what do the, the basidia make? Basidia spores, right? And you guys, let me just go grab this one. Remember we did our spore plant with our mushroom? So here's the mushroom cap. We taped it down. And what's the cocoa powder that's been released? Can you guys see the cocoa powder? It's not cocoa powder, is it? What is it? The basidia spores. Isn't that awesome? All right. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So the cap is the Yeah, the cap has those paper thin gills, and on either side of the gills, folks, are those club like structures, the basidia, and then the basidia make the basidia spores. So when you're shopping, you're always you you want fresh mushrooms when you're gonna eat them, and the caps will be closed. But in nature, if the um, once the basidia spores are mature, the under the underside of the cap opens up and the basidia spores drop down and then the breeze blows them to new places to live, new food sites. Um, then we have a, I think a zygomycetes poster. So you answered this already folks, but can you provide the genus name of a fungus that is a zygomycete? Okay, so zygomycetes, there was only one. So we said mushrooms are basidiomycetes. So who is our sole representative of the zygomycetes? Rhizopus. Rhizopus, good, the bread mold, yeah. How do rhizopus reproduce asexually? What do they form? Spor and which kind of, sp what kind of spores? Sporangiospores. Sporangiospores, right? They're formed in that balloon-like structure, good. And what kind of sexual spores does rhizopus make? Zygospores, right? That's why it's a zygomycete. Okay, good. And folks, if we um, we could have a uh, slide for you to look at, and we could have um, 
the sporangiospores or the zygospores. We could also have a plate. So, um, so folks, what are on the surface of the plate? What are the white filaments? Aerial hyphae, right? What are the black dots? Those are probably sporangia, chock full of sporangiospores, asexual. Good. And then let's see here, folks. We've got um, some um, more um, symbiotic fungi that are mutualists. Do you remember the two mutualistic fungi we described? One colonizes the roots of plants. Do you remember what we call that? And specifically colonizes the outside of the roots or can grow between the, the, um, the plant cells, but it doesn't penetrate through the plant cell wall. Do you remember what we called? Okay, close, close. We're talking um, ectomycorrhiza, remember? So which, which sample would we show you? Let's guess, what sample would we show you? Would it make sense to show you a cross section through a, a root? Yeah. yeah. Right? So you'd have the cross section of the root, and then we're going to have the pointer on all those thread like filaments on the outside. What, what are those thread like filaments? Good. That was an awesome answer. Did you hear that, you guys? Fungal hyphae? That's a beautiful answer. Right? Okay. How are the fungi helping the plant? What do plants need to grow? Why don't plants grow well during droughts? They need water, right? So the fungal hyphae, you guys, they have, they really increase the surface area for water absorption, right, which they can share with the plant. And what else can those fungal hyphae absorb and share with the plant? Like, like minerals? Good, yeah. How is the plant helping the fungi? Remember, this is win-win. Um, what do the fungi need to make ATP? They are chemoheterotrophs, right? So what do they need? Preformed organic molecules, thank you. And so what's the plant making to help the fungus? Yeah, making sugars, right, during oxygenic photosynthesis. So it's really win-win. Yeah, they're really helping one another. Good, folks. Um, what's the second example of mutualistic fungi? Good. So folks, remember, we could have a station where we could have different types of lichens. You don't, you do not need to remember if it's, if they're crustose, folios, or fruticose, but just remember, you guys, all of these are lichens in this, okay? So folks, how would you describe lichens? What are they? There's symbiosis between, yeah, so fungus for sure, and then a photosynthetic partner, and that could be either algae or cyanobacteria. So folks, if we showed you a photomicrograph of a lichen, right, and we put the pointer on the little green balls, what are the little green balls? Algae or cyanobacteria, good. And if we put it on the, the little clear filaments, what are the clear filaments? The fungal partner. How is the fungus helping the um, algae or cyanobacteria? They're often living, often in really kind of extreme environments. So you guys, the little photosynthetic partner, to carry out photosynthesis, what, what does the little photosynthetic partner need? Sunlight, right? So the fungi are anchoring the little photosynthetic partner on a surface where the sunlight will shine down upon them, right? So they're not going to get blown into a hole or a crevice. Good. And furthermore, how are the fungi helping the photosynthetic partner? Water absorption, mineral absorption. So we kind of see the same themes replaying. Good. And folks, how does a photosynthetic partner help the fungus? Good. Perfect. Right? So you, again, folks, when you often in nature, you start seeing themes repeated over and over again. So if you learn one theme, then you can apply it to different situations. Okay. Does that make sense? A little bit? Okay. Um, folks, in the lichen, the fungi belong to which domain? Good. And which kingdom? Good. Um, if we have a lichen and the photosynthetic partner is a cyanobacterium, to which domain do cyanobacteria belong? Good. If it's an algae, which domain do the algae belong to? Eukarya. Good. Excellent. Why are the algae and cyanobacteria green? 
chlorophyll A, which carries out which process? Good. I know you guys are getting tired of this repetition, but that way you'll just be dreaming about it. Okay. All right, folks. And then we're going to move to bench three. And folks, there's a slide and some photos of dermatophytes. What are dermatophytes? What are dermatophytes? It's an old fashioned name, kind of misleading. Misleading. A&P folks, what does derma sound like to you? Skin, yeah? So what are dermatophytes? They're fungi, yeah? That, where do they colonize animals? Keratinized tissues. What are three keratinized tissues in humans and animals? The skin, the stratified squamous keratinized <laughs> epithelial cells. Good. Where else? Nails. Yeah, fingernails, toenails, and where else? Hair. Hair. Good. Why are dermatophytes colonizing your keratinized tissues? Yes, they make keratinase, so that means they can do what to keratin? Digest it. And why are they doing that? Are they doing it just to destroy it, or are they they're using it as food, right? Yeah, it's a protein, so they're using it as food. Um, folks, what would be a clinical sign if you have a patient present with a dermatophyte infection, say, of their... Um, the skin of their forearm, how would it present? Yeah, yeah, it looks like a, a ring of inflamed um, tissue, right? And what's a common name? Ringworm, right? People thought in the old days it was a worm underneath. Good. And what if I had dramatified infection of my hair, folks? What would be a clinical sign? Alopecia, hair loss, right? Little circular patches of hair loss, right? Um, and what about in my nails? What if I had a dramatified infection of my nails? They're going to look discolored, yellowish brown. What would be the, um, the, I hate, this is probably not the right term, you guys. What would be the consistency? Soft. You can just peel them off, right? Because all that tough, strong um, keratin has been digested. Good. What are three reservoirs of dermatophytes? Soil. Good, the soil. Yes, animals. Yeah, little puppies or kittens. Yes. And uh, right, human to human contact, good. So, folks, if you have a, a child present, say, with a dermatophyte infection, what's a question you want to ask the family? Do they have any animals? Yeah, have you recently adopted any animals, right? Because um, little kids, especially, because, you know, like with a puppy or kitten, they just are, you know, intimate contact. So, you want to find out if there's a pet that has the dermatophyte infection because you need to treat not only the humans, you need to treat the pet as well. Okay. Good. Um, folks, then there's a, a, a poster on a bonus topic, Cryptococcus. So, folks, which kingdom does Cryptococcus belong to? And this is bonus, so if you're feeling overwhelmed, just pass on it, okay? So, which kingdom does Cryptococcus belong to? They're fungi, too, yeah. So, folks... Um, Historically, at least here in the United States, we associated Cryptococcus neoformans as being an opportunistic pathogen. It would invade immunocompromised patients. So folks, if you had like a brand new transplant recipient or someone who had HIV AIDS, or maybe somebody who was undergoing cancer therapy, what animals would you tell them to try to stay away from? Birds, right? Because remember, bird feces tends to enrich the soil for the Cryptococcus. Right? So you don't want them feeding pigeons. You don't want them raising birds. It's very sad, right? Okay. And then, folks, there's been a second species um, that is um, infecting immunocompetent people, and that's the Cryptococcus scatii. And that's associated with certain types of plants, right? Kind of, kind of bizarre. Okay. So, folks, again, this is all bonus. Um, we so say that... Plants, yeah, like eucalyptus. That's why I think initially they thought it was imported from Australia because eucalyptus seems to be a plant that it's associated with. So, folks, we say that Cryptococcus, like Coccidioides imidus, is a dimorphic fungus. What do we mean by dimorphic? Good. There's two different forms, two different forms. How does Cryptococcus, and let's include Coccidioides imidus, folks, how does it grow in the environment and the soil? is a filamentous mold, right? And then um, um, both the Cryptococcus and the Coccidioides imidus, they form spores. So how, how do humans get infected? 
inhalation, right? Yeah. And again, if we have an immunocompromised patient, especially then, um, the um, fungal pathogens, they switch to a unicellular yeast phase, cause infection in the lungs. But in an immunocompromised person, folks, they can spread throughout the body, and often they can end up with central nervous system infections. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it does. Probably a lot of us have been infected with coccidioides imidis. A lot of times they're asymptomatic infections, or maybe you feel like you have the flu and then it resolves. But in all those infections, when it gets into the lungs, when it ger germinates, it forms those unicell unicellular yeast-like phases, yeah. And then it spreads throughout the body in the yeast-like phase in the immunocompromised patient, yeah. Um, folks, and let's just go ahead. The next one was coccidioides imidis. What's the common name for coccidioides imidis infections? Yeah. Valley fever, San Joaquin Valley fever, okay. Um, as we said, you guys, probably a lot of us have been infected and don't, don't even know it. Can it leave lesions on your lungs? Yes. That, yes, it can. And so later in life, if you have a chest radiograph, those um, valley fever lesions may be confused with Lung cancer, and also I was reading, guys, it can be confused with tuberculosis. So always make sure you tell your healthcare provider, especially if you move out of California, right? <clears throat> healthcare providers might not be thinking about um, coccidioides imidus. So if you come up with a funny chest radiograph, remind them you lived in an area where you could have been infected with coccidioides imidus. Good. Um, is coccidioides imidus a dimorphic fungus? Yes, okay, and it grows is what in the soil? A fun, uh, um, right, a filamentous mold, right, lives as a sap probe in the soil, living off of dead organic matter, and then it converts to what type of stage in us? Unicellular little yeast-like phase. Good, folks. Good. Um, is coccidioides which which domain does it belong to? You carry good. Which kingdom? Fun, fungi, good. And folks, what do we call fungal infections? What's a fancy name for a fungal infection? Mycosis, good. Then folks, on bench three, there's an amoeba model. Let me, let me go grab it really quick. So folks, if, if I told you this is a model of an organism that we isolated from pond water, can you give me a scientific name for this little guy? Amoeba, Amoeba proteus, good. Um, is it a eukaryote or a prokaryote? It's eukaryote. It's eukaryote, there's a nucleus, good. What are these cytoplasmic extensions called? Pseudopods, two functions? Motility and endocytosis or phagocytosis, good, good folks. What's this marble-like structure called? Contractile vacuole function prevents osmotic lysis. How does it prevent osmotic lysis? <coughs> yes, right. That's right. It's going to pump out excess water. Good job. Folks, if in contrast, I said this is a model of a protozoan that causes amoebic dysentery. What's the scientific name for the um, protozoan that causes amoebic dysentery? Entamoeba histolytica, good. Um, what, how would the feces appear if your patient is suffering with severe amoebic dysentery? Raspberry yeah, jam. raspberry jam. And I think you guys on Canvas, I attached a file to announcement. So you actually have a, a picture of that raspberry jam or jelly feces. It's bright red, right? Because these little guys are doing what in your intestines? They're digesting your intestinal epithelial cells, right? And it's lower in the digestive tract, so you have hemorrhage bleeding into the intestine, and it comes out as bright red blood. Yeah. Can these guys penetrate the intestine? Yeah, they can spread elsewhere. They can spread, for example, to the liver. Good. What's the infectious stage of entamoeba histolytica? The cyst. The cyst. Which stage is causing the, the damage? Trophozoite. The trophozoite. If you swallow the trophozoite, would you get infected? No, why not? They're going to be killed where? In the stomach, right? They're very delicate. Good. Okay. Um, and again, folks, on the lab exam, um, if, if we're going to show you a fecal smear, 
um, it, it'll definitely be a photomicrograph and we'll have an arrow pointing to the trophozoite, right? Because those fecal smears are tough to see. Good. All right, let me put this one. Protist? Euglena, good. What's this supposed to be? Flagellum, good. Um, Euglena are called mixotrophs. What does that mean, a mixotroph? Yes, in the light, what can they do? Oxygenic photosynthesis. What are the green oval structures? Chloroplasts, good. In the dark, what do they do? They become hunters again? They're chemoheterotrophs? Good, good folks. Um, what's the red little dot here? Stigma or eye spot, what's its function? Detects light as part of the photo, photo light detection system. Good job, folks. What is um, this little marble-like structure? Contractovacuole. Good. And then there's a fecal smear here, folks of a patient that's been hiking in California for several weeks. They have a painful abdomen and they're producing fatty, foul-smelling diarrhea. So you take a fecal smear, who are you looking for? Giardia, good, right? So remember folks, um, Giardia, uh, the trophozoite, it's teardrop shape. It has the two nuclei, so it looks like it's looking up at you, right? A little flagella, good. How did the patient get infected? What's transmission? Fecal oral, right? So probably what what did the person do to get infected? Probably drank water from a stream, a river, or a lake, right? Because you just presume that all our fresh water here in California is contaminated with what? The giardia cysts, right? Good. Okay. Okay, good. That's bench three, folks. And now we're moving to bench four. So on bench four, folks, we have um, we have um, blood smears from three different patients. Okay, so your first patient um, has only lived in the Americas, so North, Central, South America, and they're presenting with what looks like congestive heart failure. Okay, and we'll pretend. I'm not sure if it, at that late stage you actually have these guys replicating in the blood, but we'll pretend. So you, you're looking at a blood smear. Folks, and you see this little delicate, kind of almost like a little worm, little S-shaped or C-shaped organism that's kind of like this. You see that it has an undulating membrane, right? So you guys, again, just within our little micro lab here, right? Who do you think this could be? Trypanosoma, and what's the species? Crucii, right? What's the name of the disease? Chagas disease or? Okay, not sleeping sickness, that's its cousin, but American. it's American trypanosomiasis. So remember, folks, the, the history, like where your patient has traveled, where they've lived, is going to be really important. Um, how did the patient get infected? What, what's one way they could have gotten infected? Okay, could be donated blood, right? What's, what's another common way in endemic areas where there's lots and lots of infections? Is this sexually transmitted? Is it fecal oral transmission? Is it arthropod vector? And what's the scientific name of the arthropod vector? A good answer would be triatoma, okay? Right. Um, how, so let's say it was a triatoma. So how how specifically did the person get infected? It's the bug, yeah, the so-called kissing bug, right? They come out at night when you're asleep, right? They take a blood mill up near your mouth, right? Is the pathogen in the saliva or where is it? In the feces, right? So the feces gets wiped into the bite wound or you wipe it into your eye, right? Good. Have we found Trypanosoma cruzii in donated blood in California? Yes. Do we have do we have insects that could vector Trypanosoma cruzii here in California? We do. Yeah. Okay. So folks, now let's go to a patient that has been traveling in Africa, 
and um, let's say their partner says they just seem to be like somnolent. They're just really sleepy, kind of, it's like they just can't wake up. They're not very alert. Take a blood sample and you see something like this, bigger, more numerous. Um, what is your diagnosis? Trypan Trypanosoma brucei, and what's the name of the infection? African trypanosomiasis, also known as sleeping sickness. Good. How did that patient get infected? Good. The bite of the blood feeding. So, what's the vector you gave? Glycina. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so again, folks, what's going to be really important is you carefully read the description of the specimen, right? So look for where, where the patient has lived, where they've traveled, right? Because that's going to be really important. So another patient comes in, folks, with these intermittent fevers. Every um, 48 to 72 hours, they spike a fever and eventually it comes down. And then in another 40 to 72 hours, they spike the fever again. You take a blood sample, and this time you see red blood cells that have little parasites inside of them. Who, who do you think, what do you think your patient is suffering from? What's the name of the pathogen? Okay, so if, um, if I ask you for a genus name, what are you going to tell me? Plasmodium, good. How did your patient get infected? And for full credit, you guys, what's the genus name of the mosquitoes? Anopheles mosquitoes, good. Do we have um, Anopheles mosquitoes here in California that can transmit malaria? We sure do, good. Um, so folks, rem let's see here, things to remember. Um, so the plasmodium are intracellular parasites, right? They're replicating inside our cells. They're first infecting the liver, right? And they replicate asexually and then release the um, parasites and then they invade the red blood cells, right? So they're replicating inside the red blood cells. And then when the female mosquito takes a blood meal, that's how she gets infected. And then eventually when she bites again, when she injects the saliva, that's how um, a new host gets infected. Good. Um, it, is the plasmodium, uh, which domain do the plasmodium belong to? Okay, close. You guys, which domain do plasmodium belong to? Eukarya. Good, good. All right, and then, folks, another model. So, folks, what's the genus name of this protozoan? Paramecium. Paramecium, good. What's missing? Cil cilia, good. Um, so, folks, what is, oh, ciliates have two nuclei. What's this nucleus called? Macronucleus. What's this little baby one called? Micronucleus, what's the function? Like well, just it just it's involved in sexual reproduction. Good job, folks. What's this starburst thing? Contractile vacuole, good. What's the process at the tip of the pointer? Endocytosis or phagocytosis. What's the process, you guys, at the tip of the pointer? Exocytosis. Good job. Good. Okay. So, folks, do remember, and again, this is not exhaustive, but folks, do remember um, we could have questions on lab equipment. What are the names of the lab equipment? What are their functions? Um, we could have um, screw cap tubes with broth or auger in them. What are safety issues when we're um, using screw cap tubes to incubate our microbes? Always loosen the cap. Yeah, always loosen the cap before you put them in the incubator, if you put them in your lockers, and really importantly, too, folks, when you put them in the kill area, good. Labels, folks, are really important. What information should go on a good label for your microbial cultures? The name of the microbe, your, your name, right, your name, the date, and your lab section, right? If we were um, growing microbes in a screw cap tube, where does the label go? 
on the glass body. Always put the label where the microbes are growing. On an auger plate, folks, where would the label go? On the bottom, right? Um, let's say you transferred your microbes to an auger plate. How do you incubate it? You invert it, right? Do you tape the lid to the bottom so the lids don't come off? Good. Okay. And again, folks, this is not exhaustive, but those are just like some... Oh, do make sure, folks, you know how to deal with a microbial spill, right? What are the steps in dealing with microbial spill? Um, and do remember, you guys, and again, I don't mean to be funny, but it's like on a safety question, if it's a fill-in-the-blank fill in question, if you have no idea, if you say wash your hands, I'll give you a partial credit, right? Because if in doubt, in the micro lab, just wash your hands. Okay, good. Um, do remember back to the incinerator safety rules, right? We need to make sure we keep everybody safe. Um, we always have a station, folks, with a microscope, and we have the parts letter label. So I could ask you, what's the name of part A? What's the function of part B? So you want to make sure you go over the microscope parts and functions. Um, let's say, folks, you're working with your oil immersion lens. What's total magnification? A thousand, right? So it's ocular 10x times the magnifying power of the objective. So 10 times 100 is a thousand. Um, why do we use immersion oil with the oil immersion lens? It decreases light refraction bending, right? So the light is going to travel in, in a straighter path from the glass through the specimen through the oil and into the objective lens. What does that do, folks? By decreasing light refraction, what, do, what are we increasing? Resolution, right? The clarity with which we can see the specimen. So it doesn't look fuzzy and blurry. Good. So we can use oil. What else can we do, folks, to increase resolution? What kind of adjustments do we use when we're working with oil immersion lens? Other adjustments we, we use? Good. Increase the light, the rheostat, up to 10. What else? Good. Raise the substage condenser so all the light is focused on the specimen. And one more thing. Think of your eye, your pupil, the iris diaphragm lever. You want to open it up so you get the maximum amount of light. Good. Folks, what if it's... What if we want to do the opposite? Let's say we're looking at a wet mount of microbes that have no color and we want to increase contrast. What can we do? The opposite, right? Decrease the light intensity, lower the substage condenser, and shut down the iris diaphragm. Awesome. Um, folks, definitely make sure that you know that with the hydri lens or the oil immersion lens, which focus adjustment knob do we use? Only find focus, right? Make sure you know where that is. Um, what's another idea? Um, we'll have different types of paper at the station and ask you which paper or papers can you use to clean your um, lenses and which one are you going to choose? Only lens paper, right? Folks, not chem wipes, not Kleenex, not toilet paper, not um, paper towels. Good. Oh, yes, and folks, there will be one estimating cell size based on what? Diameter of the field of view. So we'll give you the diameter of the field of view in millimeters, right? And then you're going to visualize, you're going to estimate how many cells would it take to cross the diameter of the field of view. And folks, we're going to get big cells. There's not going to be little tiny bacteria, right? And then you divide the diameter of the field of view by the number of cells it takes to span, to cross the diameter, right? Then we're going to ask you to express your answers in micrometers. So how many micrometers are in a millimeter? A thousand, right? And what if we had you convert then from micrometers to nanometers? How many nanometers are in a micrometer? A thousand, okay? So people have been asking if we'd have any metrics on the lab exam. That would probably be the only metrics type question that would be on the lab exam, okay? Um, Let's see here. Another one, you guys, and I think this, this will do it after this, and thanks for your patience, is our smears and stains. So, folks, what are the advantages of heat fixing our smears? There's actually several advantages. So it causes the cells to stick to the slide so they won't wash away when we add our liquid reagents. What else? preserves the cells, right? If you run out of time, you know, once you heat fix them, stick them in your locker and they'll be good for weeks. Um, let's see here. If it's a pathogen, might it help kill the, the microbes, right? So it's safer to work with. And the last one, you guys, maybe a little bit weaker, is that some people think it increases dye uptake so that the, um, the cells stain better. What are disadvantages of heat fixing? 
distortion. Good. Distortion, right? Cell shape, cell size, and you can't see if they're motile. You can't see if they move, right? Because they're dead, right? Very importantly, folks, you need to know the names, functions, and order of the gram stain reagent. So help me out, you guys. What's the first gram stain reagent you're going to add to your heat fix smear? Crystal violet. Crystal violet. What is its function? It's a primary stain. Everything is going to stain what color? Purple. So gram positive bacteria, gram negative bacteria. What about your cells? How will they stain? Purple, right? Everybody's purple. And then, folks, the, um, the next reagent, sodium. sodium bicarbonate. This is a buffer. It helps to increase the pH, so we'll have more negative charges on our cells to, um, um, to increase dye attachment. Good. What's the third one, folks? Mm -hmm. Gram's iodine. What's the function? It's called the mordant, and what it's going to do is it's going to combine with the crystal violet to make these great big, huge purple um, dye complexes. Okay, you guys, how would gram positive bacteria appear after gram's iodine? Purple. How would gram negative bacteria appear after gram's iodine? Purple. Good. Okay. How would human cells appear after gram's iodine? Purple. Purple. Good. So, what this is a differential stain. Um, which reagent? you guys, is actually the differential reagent where we first see a difference between gram-negative bacteria, gram-positives, and also between human cells and gram-positives. It's the alcohol ethanol. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> ethanol is an alcohol. The, the alcohol acetone, and what is its function, folks? Decolorizer, right? So who will hold on to those great big crystal violet iodine complexes? Yeah, gram-positive bacteria, the thick layers of peptoglycan trap it. What happens to gram-negative bacteria? Thin layer of peptoglycan, right? The crystal violet iodine gets washed out. The cells decolorize. What happened to your cells, your human cells? They decolorize, right? Because what kind of cell wall do human cells have? No cell wall. Good. So, folks, those um, now colorless cells are going to be hard to see. So we need to do what? The last reagent is our... Saffronin and what's a function? <coughs> Counter stain or secondary stain. So this will stain the colorless cells. What color? Red. Red. So folks, gram negative bacteria after the gram stain will appear what color? Red. Human cells after the gram stain will appear what color? Red. Uh, young, healthy, gram positive bacteria will appear what color? Purple. Now notice how I said young, healthy, gram positive bacteria. What if we use old? gram positive bacteria and we gram stain it. What false result might we get? A false gram negative. Why? This peptoglycan is breaking down. Yeah. So when you decolorize, it can't trap the crystal violet, crystal violet iodine inside. Okay. Um, so that would cause a false gram negative. What, what if, folks, you have healthy gram positive bacteria, but you add way too much alcohol acetone? That could also give a false gram negative, right? You over decolorize. Good. What if you're working with gram negative bacteria and you're so worried about over decolorizing, you only add a tiny bit of alcohol acetone? Which false result might you get? False gram positive, right? You under decolorized. Good. And furthermore, folks, if you have gram negative bacteria and you make a really thick smear, layers and layers and layers and layers of cells. Might it be that the bacteria in the lower layers don't get decolorized? So could you end up with false gram positives if you have really thick smears? Okay. Um, what if you know with certainty, folks, that you have a pure culture, you do a gram stain, and you see both red and purple cells? What do we call that gram reaction? Gram variable, good. Can you think of a quick desk? Bench top test you could run to verify whether your bacteria are gram negative or gram positive. Good. 3% KOH. Good. So you guys, if your bacteria are truly gram negative bacteria and you mix them with your 3% KOH and you lift your loop, what would you see if they're truly gram negatives? That little snotty strand, what is that snotty strand? Chromosomal DNA. And it's telling you that your bacteria likes to the 3% KOH and therefore you know um, that they would be gram-positive bacteria. What if you're working with another culture, folks, and you mix your um, bacteria with the KOH, and there's no snotty strand, that tells you they are gram-positive, right? Thick layer of peptoglycan. They won't lice in 60 seconds with KOH. Um, must you use 
bacteria grown on solid media for the KOH test? Yes, because you need lots and lots of bacteria. It won't work on raw. Good. And then the last one, folks, is um, acid fast stain. So, folks, can you tell me what's the primary stain in the acid fast staining protocol? Carbol fuchsin, right? And remember, historically, you would steam your cells as you're adding the carbol fuchsin. So, folks, how would, um, after adding carbol fuchsin, what color would acid fast bacteria be? Red. What color would non acid fast bacteria be? Red. What color would human cells be? Red. Okay. What is the second reagent, the decolorizer, in the acid fasting? Acid alcohol, hydrochloric acid, right? So we let our, our, our um, cells cool. So folks, um, will acid fast bacteria decolorize in the presence of acid? Nope, that's why they're called acid fast. So they'll remain what color? Red. What will happen to non-acid fast bacteria? Will they decolorize? Yes. What happens to human cells? Will they decolorize? Yes. Yeah? Okay. And then what's the third reagent, the counter stain or secondary stain? Methylene blue. Okay. So what color will acid fast bacteria be, folks, following the acid fast stain? Red. Okay. So acid fast positive is red. What color will non-acid fast bacteria be? Blue. So acid fast negative is blue. What color will human cells be? Blue. Good. So folks, can you name two pathogens, two important pathogens that are described as being acid fast? Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae. Good. Good job. So I think that's it, folks. I, and again, that was not extensive. I have to really cover myself. That was just to give you an idea of kind of the level of questions we would be asking you, kind of the level of detail, right? So you guys, and I do apologize, that took like over an hour, so I apologize for that, but we have another hour just to, for you to do free flow, to review. Um, if there's any specimens that you don't see that you want me to get out, I'll be willing to do that. Also, folks, we do have Dr. Holland put out the posters. There's the microbial cast of characters poster, nitrogen fixation poster, periodontal disease, that would be connected to biofilms. There's a coxioides imidis, a beer, and, uh, beer production, Fungal cell structures, claviceps purpurea, fungal cell structures, a malaria poster, and a lichens poster, right? And um, so again, this is just a time for you to um, review for the lab exam. And then on Monday, no, Monday, sorry. On Thursday, I'll try not to talk, right? I'll try to truly just do a quick introduction and then let you have it as an open lab, okay? We will have an open lab this Friday from um, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then again, folks, our lab exam would be a week from today on Tuesday. And, and again, we'll probably start a little bit later. So I'll, I'll announce that on Thursday and post it on, um, on Canvas as well. Okay. So you guys just yell if there's anything you can't find or you have a question. I might be working on that concept map. So I might have my back turned to you. So just yell, you know, yell out, come get me if you have a question. All right. Okay. So hopefully this movie worked.